Hey everybody, I'm Jessica from Gameward Bound, or I'm Albia on Board Game Geek. You might also know me as the Breaker of Wallets, or just somebody who plays solo a lot. <laughs> so thank you again to Ed for having me on his channel as another guest appearance here to talk about solo. I wanted to go over seven essential solo board game categories and a couple of games from my collection that sort of fits into this. And what is this about? Um, I have found that getting unplayed games to my table has been difficult lately because I will usually go for games that I love and that I've played before. So categorizing has actually helped me get more games to the table and also to understand my collection. So I hope that this is useful as a, a pretty simple method to kind of go through your collection see what's going on, <laughs> understand your preferences a little more, and maybe get more games to the table. Because if there's anything that we need to do, it's play more games, especially solo. <laughs> so let's dive in. And again, this may be useful, it may not, but I'm gonna go through some games that probably haven't shown up on my top 10 games lists. So there's gonna be a couple fun games that I'll quickly mention um, as I go through this system that has worked for me. It may be great for you, Feel free to use everything here, some of it or none of it. <laughs> so let's get started. And I don't really have an order to these. So there's not like a best category versus a worst, but just an idea of how to create this framework for looking at our collection. And this is not meant to be a job or work or a lot of effort. It's basically thinking about this as we're playing games and figuring out those categories these might fit into. And I think this works for collections that could be 10 games, could be 100 games, could be 1,000 games. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that this works for, I think. So first up, my first category that I think of when I think of essential solo games are relaxing games. A couple years ago, I would have said relaxing games. That, that's not even a game. That's, that's like an activity. You spend five or 10 minutes. How can you get a game out of that? completely changed um, because I used to have time to have, you know, an, an hour, two hours to put into these strategic complex games every day, which was great. And I love those games. But as life happens, <laughs> we find that there's usually days when we are tired. We have no time. We don't have the mental energy or the, the effort. We can't just get to the table and get something complex out and set up for, you know, t even 10 minutes of setup for a game we love can feel overwhelming. So relaxing games, these ones are really light. Simple rule sets, easy to remember, easy to get to the table, and just have a very calm sort of atmosphere for us. They may actually feel a little repetitive. And sometimes that's a negative with games, um, but when you're looking for something to play on a day when you've had a rough day or you're just tired, because <laughs> it happens to everybody, we just want something that we can get to the table or wherever and just spend that five minutes playing a solo game. So what stands out for me with relaxing games is that there's this sort of cadence or rhythm to them as we're playing. Uh, the number one on this list for me, because it changed my thinking on this is herbaceous by Pencil First Games. And this one is, this was the solo game that changed how I thought of these games. Um, usually, you know, quick games, they might actually be called filler games. I'm not a huge fan of that categorization, but sure. <laughs> but for solo, we don't usually have filler games. We're, we're not necessarily getting together with ourself <laughs> and saying, okay, I want to start off and warm up with a game. No, we, we have the time to just say, everybody in the game group is here because it's me. <laughs> I just want to dive into this, get set up done and get playing. So these so-called filler games can actually be more relaxing. They just serve a slightly different purpose for us. So when I play, again, Herbaceous I'm using as an example, another one I have in this category is 11 Z's for one, which on this cover, it's not clear, but it also includes ba -ba -ba, Bowling Solitaire. Good old Sid Saxon, <laughs> which is actually how I learned to score bowling via a board game. Um, but these games, 
what they have in common with that cadence I'm talking about. They do not have those highs and lows. So for me, a relaxing game is not a, a dice game um, because those can be exciting rolls or, ah, I didn't do so great. There's kind of highs and lows to that gameplay. With these ones, it's very neutral, especially for herbaceous. I'm counting out every round. One, two, three, as I'm putting those cards out into those different buckets, either public, private garden, or into the discard. And even with bowling solitaire, I deal it out, and then I'm trying to do sums. I'm going seven plus one is eight. Over here, two plus three plus one. There's all these, it just kind of has that rhythm to it. So relaxing games, I think these are very important, especially if you want to try to play a solo game every day. I set that challenge for myself and I'm pretty sure, I think I'm up to over a year at this point, mostly due to herbaceous. <laughs> but relaxing games, they are very important and I discounted them for a really long time, but they are amazing, especially on days when you're just too tired. And it happens to me a lot. <laughs> So the next category is what I call thematic games, but these are not just what we would think of as typical thematic games. These are ones that are specifically fun for us. In the solo world, uh, we kind of have a unique sort of perspective on this because a lot of times with theme, if we're thinking in terms of a game group, because I do play multiplayer, I do have a couple of game groups I participate in, uh, we have to take that theme into account for everybody in the group. So if so-and-so doesn't like this, that's not going to be a game for us. So we don't even want to touch it. With solo, it's just, again, it's just me. I get to pick and say, I like that theme. That is fun. I love that. So these games kind of have like an emotional attachment. Um, and it's this is not meant to be just a catch-all category because there's an accounting principle where we always talk about the miscellaneous expenses, fantastic category, works well if you have one or two in there, but there's this <laughs> fantastic phenomenon where everything gets bucketed in there. And that's why I wanna be careful with these categories as I'm talking about them. None of these should be a catch-all for just throw everything in there. Um, these should be meaningful categories that help you get games to the table and help you understand what you like and maybe what you don't like so much in solo games. So for the thematic ones, this is the category that I, I can't even tell you what an essential specific game is for this because we all have different themes. Some examples from my collection of random ones that I love. Roll camera and this box, if I can get it. Where is it? It's that side. It's an actual clapper box, come on. <laughs> but you have all these bean people and you're forming a film with all different types of actions and there's dice in here and you're setting up scenes and it is hugely thematic because uh, what part of it is you can succeed by making an amazing movie or you can succeed by making a movie that's so bad it's good and I love those movies in a love-hate type of way <laughs> An hour or two hours of my time just wasted, but for the laughs, it's worth it. So that's one theme that kind of really resonates with me. I have so many game boxes, so pardon all the reaching and moving around here. <laughs> but another one in this thematic category. Ugh. Code word Cromwell, <laughs> which is a, a large box here. We're going to put that down. Uh, but that one is a completely narrative sort of based experience where you're actually defend, you're defending Berkham Stokes, uh, a, a British village. And it's, it's kind of a, an alternate World War II timeline where the, the Germans have invaded Britain and you're fending them off with everything in town. Um, these are untrained, you know, just, just regular people, I guess. Uh, is what it kind of describes them as, but it's just people who are in their village trying to defend it, and there are so many cinematic type moments in that game too. I mean, there's pool cues as a weapon. Um, you can get the Rolls Royce into action and be driving all over the place, saving people, and, and you know, there's a, a hidden traitor mechanic. So that one is 
way out there. I don't know, I don't know what you would classify that game as in in most senses, but for me that's one of my really fun games. I love that game. And I'm sad that it is out of print. But I digress. <laughs> So that's thematic games. And again, as I'm describing these, you can I hope it comes through that. I mean, I love all solo games, but it's really the themes there that are getting to me. It's it's not like, yes, this is a dice based game or yes, I'm I'm building a deck here and that's what I enjoy about it. No, those are the ones that I'm like, let me tell you about this <laughs> and what you're doing and, and where the setting is. So that I think is important. The thematic games category um, is important because that's the one that sort of gets us, I think, back into the hobby. There's times when solo games are too much, we need a break, it happens. If it happens to you, it's a hobby. Don't ever think of this as a job or work. Have fun. <laughs> that's what solo games are all about. So the thematic category here for me is the one that will remind me, oh yeah, I remember when I had that great experience. I just, you know, I drove the Rolls Royce, <laughs> or I made this fantastic movie that I thought was not going to work because I had this disaster happen and my crew was not showing up to work, but somehow we pulled it off at the last minute. There's those moments, those, the, those actual fun solo moments that are memorable, and I think that comes a lot from thematic games. So moving on <laughs> to the next category. These are core games. These form kind of the foundation of a collection. And that's an important piece here. Um, whether you're new to the hobby or you've you know, had years of experience, you want to know what your core games are, the ones that have stood the test of time, the ones that you go back to time after time that nothing has really beat out. These are the ones that you enjoy. Again, not so much like the thematic games category for the theme, but for a combination, it could be, the theme could be a piece of it, but these are the ones that define solo gaming for you. These might, and this is a really useful category to figure out, do I like dice games? Do I like deck building games? Um, do I like tableau builders, tile laying games? You'll kind of see, you might find some similarities in these, but it could be a very eclectic mix of what forms your core. Um, my core games. Uh, thinking about this, one of them, which seems odd, it's Thurn and Taxis, or Turn and Taxis. Oh, pronounce it correctly, but I don't know. The The only thing that matters about this cover is that th this, where am I? This is me when game board deliveries come, and I, I would like this. I need, where is he? Mm -mm. I need that. <laughs> from every time my board games come in. There is an unofficial solo variant for this, which is fantastic. It forms sort of a puzzle as you are putting out the different colored postal uh, houses. I just call them houses. And I love the map in this. Um, I have graduated up through the advanced difficulty level and it is challenging to me still, even after however many plays. That for me is, that's what I love at getting out of a solo experience. I get the puzzle, but I also get to enjoy nice artwork <laughs> within a theme. Again, the theme can play a role here, um, but I'm not, sorry to say, I'm not emotionally invested in delivering mail, <laughs> but I still love it for what it is. Another one that kind of fits in my core games, I think I've mentioned this one before, Expedition, Northwest Passage. This one's by Matigo. Where are we? Mm -hmm. uh, this one is a tile laying game where we are going across the ocean from Greenland uh, and trying to find the Northwest Passage, which is up all the way up kind of through Canada, um, through ice and water. And it's a tile laying game, but it's also an exploration based game. So we're building a map and we have a sled and a, a ship and there's a crew that can get split between them. There's seasons that go around. And this is another one that I define as a really good solo experience for me. It's tile laying, um, which I found is one of my favorite mechanics. I like laying tiles. Also, I like creating a map. So anything that kind of has to do with those, I've learned, oh, you know what? I should probably take a look at that because I'm, again, I'm categorizing and saying, here's my core, here's my foundation. But the other flip side of this is that 
when you have your core games, you might say, great, I know what I love. Let me go find something similar every time. That works. But the other side, you might say, huh, you know what? I've never tried maybe a war game or I've never tried a dice game or worker placement. I don't, I haven't really done that. So this might actually give you insight into areas you haven't tried before. And that's kind of cool. That's, that's another fun part of solo for me is trying new games and new mechanics and discovering what works because there's a lot that could work some not so much <laughs> but that process of discovery and getting all these games to the table is just awesome so that's core games another category is what i call challenging games these are the ones that are going to be difficult to win or they might have goals or scenarios either within the box or you set for yourself. You might say, I want to play through every character at this difficulty level. I want to do all these combinations. There's some type of challenge, whether it is just, I can't beat this. <laughs> or I want to play this and explore it some more in a way that I'm defining. And what, what this does is challenging games and challenges in general are kind of a... a what, I can't even think of a double-sided, oh no, a two, I can't even think of the right phrase. Good job. My mind's in board games right now, not in actual like common phrases. <laughs> a double-edged sword. There it is. Okay, I got it. <laughs> we made it there. <laughs> but challenges can be great because they kind of give you a reason to get a game to the table and sort of a goal to work towards. It's It may not be just win. It could be. But it might be, I need to follow these conditions or do this exactly. The other side of it is that having that set challenge can sometimes feel like a chore. Um, and I've had both of these happen. Sometimes it's great. I love having a challenge and saying, yes, I'm working towards this. I want to do this. This is the game that I'm working on it towards. Other times, I feel kind of shoehorned in there where I'm forced to, I, got, I say, oh yeah, that's the one that I got to work on again. You know what? Let me, let me keep going, keep going, keep going. And that's when the fun kind of goes away. So challenging here can mean a, l a lot of different things. Um, and again, it's th this whole categorization. I'm trying to keep it loose enough that it works, I hope, for a wide variety of collections and different types of players mostly solo, but again, this hopefully this is a, a good way to look at how to consider a collection. And the challenging games for me, I have a bunch. <laughs> I'm not, I don't pretend to be a master of many games. Um, there's a few that I'm great at and many that I continue to work towards. Challenging games for me, pandemic. And that's right. That is the original cover right there. Look at that. That's beautiful. Mm. <laughs> Pandemic is always difficult um, for me, but I like it. I like the challenge of that. And of course, as if the original Pandemic wasn't enough, I mean, I have, you know, Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu, because why not? Of course, this is also a great, a great one. And uh, the Pandemic system is awesome because it does not just use, you know, it's not just a theme pasted onto the same system. It changes every time. So there, that's always a challenge for me, but that is a fun one because I'm like, this could be it. This could be the time that I'm going to win. And maybe one day. Another one on this list. I'm gonna try to lift it. Uh, the, the face is due to the fact that I decided to bring a giant heavy box to the table. So I'm gonna lift this shortly, but Mmm, Tricarion. My Mind Clash games. Heavy? Yes, in, in every sense. <laughs> I'm going to put that down. There's a lot of components in there. Awesome, amazing quality, great game. Just not easy to hold in front of the camera for a long period of time. <laughs> but that one is all about being a magician. Um, but a performance magician, it, is, it doesn't have to do with actually doing magic, but the whole magic trick process of how those are formed and getting components and learning how to create these tricks and perform them. Um, it's very involved, but very fun. 
And the solo mode for me is one that is super challenging. I cannot beat it at this time in my life <laughs> for whatever reason, but it's great. And that's one that I know is a challenge. Um, I know I want to get that to the table because it is a challenge. And again, that's why this is, this is a useful categorization system. I know that that is not a relaxing game. Um, it might have some crossover and some games will definitely fit into different categories. Um, so it might be a little bit of a thematic game. I do like the idea of having that unique experience of being a magic performer. <laughs> because I can't even shuffle cards properly. So I am, I am no magician. Mm -mm, not at all. <laughs> but I am a solo player, so that's fine. <laughs> so those four categories sort of form... Um, the, I think those ones work for a lot of collections, but what then ends up happening is we might need some subcategories or we might find out we like certain things, maybe don't like certain things, but the next three categories kind of go into getting down to those specifics. So for instance, we might, the next category is a type of game. So this could be like dice games. This could be deck building games, tile laying games hidden movement games, which are not common in solo, but Black Sonata, <laughs> which I've mentioned a few times. Um, but an example here would be like campaign games. And the reason I say this is because I, in the past, I really was not drawn to campaign or legacy games. Um, I, I just wanted to have a game that I could reset and keep playing over and over again. But having a sort of a process of going through a campaign has actually started to take off for me and it's it's been interesting i mean in the last month at this point i've played through role player adventures dice throne adventures two completely different games but lots of adventures <laughs> but also campaigns um and another one that i haven't played in a long time but it's you know it's due is oh this one's heavy aftermath adventure book game yes it was by plaid hat um aftermath i loved that that was that was another one that might even fall into a thematic game for me because you are these critters running around you know me i know i love my calico critters or sylvanian families they're little little animals that i collect um and they're fun and they're cute and that one you're running around sort of in a post-apocalyptic setting where there's no humans and trying to collect resources and exploring and completing these different scenarios and quests and it's fun and it's and you're building up your base too you kind of you start off with nothing and you build it over time you get access to new equipment or new areas and new abilities it's fun it's awesome and me as i look at this um and saying I have a bunch of campaign type games in my collection, these could also be seen as once in a while type games. So when I'm thinking of something to play and I see those boxes and I'm like, oh no, I haven't played in a while. Guess what? Makes sense. It's a campaign game. <laughs> You're not gonna play that over and over again. You need a little break in between, at least I do, in order to kind of forget a lot of the, the specific story details and then come back at a later time and have fun all over again and try to take some different paths. So that's another one that just categorizing games by the type helps us understand, or I hope it does, uh, understand a little more about what we have in our collection and what we like. And especially if we find out, you know, I have two games that I'm categorizing like this, four here, 10 here, and then wait a second, I have like 30, um, and I, I don't know why I'm going back to dice today, but 30 dice games. So maybe then that has to break down and you might say, okay, maybe I have like, these are lightweight dice games. These are, you know, or these are ones where the dice are actually not rolled. There are games where dice are used more as counters than as rolling around. <laughs> so there might be ways to form subcategories and say, oh, you know what? I like this in these games. So again, maybe I want to keep an eye out for this type of game. Or when I'm looking for games to play in my collection, let me get it from this category today. And then I don't want to overload and play the same type of game over and over, or maybe I do, <laughs> but you can kind of go from category to category. Another way 
to categorize games, we're getting towards the end here, it's the second to last one, is a series of games. And this is sometimes useful, sometimes not. An example here is the West Kingdom trilogy, Paladins, Architects, and Viscounts. That's a series of games. They're all sort of interconnected within the same sort of world. Um, and there's a way even, what is it, the Tome Saga? Tome Saga? Duh. Pronunciation, not my strong suit today. But there's a way to actually connect all the games together and play through them um, in a way that, like kind of a campaign style. Hmm, maybe it's a campaign game, not a series. I'll have to uh, look at my categorization. <laughs> but you have that idea. Um, and actually, let's let's get you on out here. Paladins, right there, which I played Architects. Paladins has been opened, but not played yet. See, I, I know I need to get it played because I have the series, and I haven't gone through the whole series yet. So I need to see what I like, what I don't like. But a series is a little bit different in that you're looking at a connected world or setting. Another example of this, and I do I have... I don't have it out here, um, but the Valeria games. Uh, you have Card Kingdoms of Valeria, or is it Valeria Card Kingdoms? I always mix it up, but there's all, you know, Villages of Valeria, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. They're all set within the same setting, very different games with different mechanics, but you might see a little connection there. Um, and that might be a reason to say, I love this series. I need to keep an eye on it, and I want to go deeper into this. Or you might find that you own a whole series of games, again, like the, the West Kingdom trilogy, and you might say, you know what? I like this one and this one, but not that one so much. So I don't think that a series categorization really works for this. Let me break those down into, you know, whatever type of mechanics there they are, or maybe one of them is gonna fit in my core games or something like that. Again, it's a way to understand our preferences and our collections. And that's what's really helping me right now uh, in getting those unplayed games to the table and then saying, should I categorize this or should I put it into the find a new home category? <laughs> Which is not a bad thing. Um, because again, holding on to games that I'm not gonna play, there's no reason to. Someone else out there is probably gonna enjoy that game more than I did. So move it along. These shelves are packed and it's hard to see in this video, but there are two five by five calyxes here, games everywhere, and there might even be another board game room. There's a lot, so <laughs> moving games along is not a bad thing. And finally, another category that is another useful way to look at our games is looking at it by the designer or the publisher. So this is often something that happens over time. So when we're new to solo games or even new to board games, probably not following a specific publisher or designer or solo variant designer. It's just we're playing games that we enjoy and learning more about them. But I think there comes a point where, at least for me, there are certain publishers that I'm like, oh yeah, I loved these ones. They did such a great job. I've enjoyed all their games. Let me Keep an eye on everything that they're doing because they've, they're have they delivering experiences that I enjoy. So having these categorized that way is also a reminder to say, yes, you know what? I follow that publisher. That's someone that I want to buy more games from. <laughs> or at the very least, do more research on. I, I'm known as the breaker of wallets um, because I, way too many solo game purchases. I make people buy games all the time and I'm sorry, wallets of the world. <laughs> <laughs> but the biggest thing, most importantly, research new games. Don't just go out there and buy what looks popular. I just want to say that because I fell down that, I fell down that, I guess, I guess that's a rabbit hole right there of just buying whatever was popular. It doesn't work. I'll just say that <laughs> and leave it there. Um, but we can look at it by publisher, but also by designer or solo designer. Uh, my husband is super into David Turksey, even though he's played Anachrony solo one time in his life, but there he is. He's a solo gamer. Okay, we'll give it to you. <laughs> but as, you know, him mentioning that almost as a joke, I said, you know what? We do own a lot of David Turksey games. I mean, another one. Ba -doop -ba -doop. Imperium Legends. 
that one, fun, will say, I did forget to check for the errata prior to playing. And there's a little bit of an issue <laughs> if you play solo and don't realize what really needs to happen with unrest cards. It's fine. Just be aware of that. If you get into Imperium Classics or Imperium Legends, just make sure you're using the most up-to-date rulebook so you have a good solo experience. <laughs> but again, that is a solo designer that I'm like, all right, that a lot of those games could also fall into the challenging category for me. I have not mastered those at all. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of strategizing and they're heavier games, but they're fun. Again, that's what we're trying to do with this is find those fun experiences. So that's it. Those are the seven categories that I say are the essential solo board game categories. And why do I say essential? Because as you go through and sort of start categorizing games in this way, I think you'll find the essentials in your collection, which is different from just that core game category I talked about. You'll find these are the games. This is what makes solo what it is for me. And that's going to be different for everybody. Uh, I made this video because I've been asked, you know, what, what do you think are the top 10 essential solo games? And I started thinking and I said, you know what? I don't know. I know what they are. Actually, no, at that point, I didn't even know what they were for me. I had to go through the process of starting to categorize games and say, all right, these are my core games. Here's my thematic games. And then kind of coming up with, oh, you know what? These are the games that are essential for me. But you know what? These categories are going to be different for every single person. So I've shown a couple of examples of what I have in those categories. It's very difficult to make an essential game list. I think especially for solo because we all have our different preferences. I have I have random war games in here. I have simulation games where I'm not even really playing a game technically. And in some circles, we would argue if that was an activity or a game. Um, I have old games in here that you can't get anymore, out of print games. I have strange games <laughs> that, that I don't I don't know if anybody has really heard of or played. There, there's a, a huge just collection here. <laughs> but being able to categorize them has really helped me in understanding what I like. And I'm seeing, you know, there, you know, there might be a void of I don't have this type of game, but you know why? Because I don't like that game. And I can go back and think, ah, that's why. That game didn't work for me. So that's why I haven't really explored this type of game again. And that's what solo gaming is all about, though, for, for me, at least, is exploring and discovering all these great games. And I think that's why, even with so many games that I have, I still enjoy that new experience because there's something different. Um, even games with the same mechanics or from the same publisher or designer, there's something different every time. And maybe it works better. Maybe it doesn't, but there is something to find and have fun with. So that's that's solo gaming. <laughs> but I am going to end it here. So thank you for watching. And I hope that this was useful. Again, it might be, it might not be. Feel free to use it. Feel free to change it up. Whatever. <laughs> the most important thing, have fun with solo games. Understand what you're going for with your collection. And maybe you're fine. Again, this might mean I don't need any new games. I have it all. <laughs> and then maybe, just maybe, you'll be safe on Board Game Geek in the One Player Guild from me, Breaker Wallets. <laughs> all right. Thanks again for watching and take care. Bye.